It's time. Time to get credit for the work you've done. Time to get the recognition you deserve. With Purdue Global, you can move forward in your career, for your family, and for yourself. You're worth the investment in yourself to earn a degree you're proud of, a degree that employers will respect. Purdue's online university is designed to support working adults like you who know it's never too late to accomplish your goals. It's never too late to make a comeback. It's time to start yours today at purdueglobal.edu. A group of high school students started a project to research a string of unsolved murders. There is no profile of this killer except for the ones the students created. What if this guy's still alive? Like, what if he comes after us? Once you start getting a few tips or a few leads or a few identifications, then the cold case isn't so cold anymore. This is Murder 101. Listen to Murder 101 on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Episode 50, The Truth About Student Loan Forgiveness. Welcome to the Frugal Friends Podcast, where you'll learn to save money, money, embrace simplicity, and live a richer life. Here are your hosts, Jen and Jill. Boom, boom, boom. Embracing the truth. We we are all about the truth today. <laughs> Welcome to the Frugal Friends podcast. Happy Frugal Friends Friday, if you're listening to this when it comes out. I am Jen. Hey, it's Jill. And we are really excited about today's guest, Travis Hornsby from Student Loan Planner. Mm. He is the expert on everything student loan forgiveness. And so whether you are on the route to forgiveness want to be forgiven, haven't taken it up with the Lord yet. Uh, (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) It sounded like that's where it was going, but it's not. It's actually going to your student loans. So we had a really great conversation with him about things to know, things to watch out for, and then also probably some things you won't hear on any other podcast. Guaranteed. I've never Guaranteed. heard it. It was new you to won't. my ears. So, But they're not illegal. Nope. They're not illegal. So we are we included them. We didn't edit them out. We only include the truth and legal things in this podcast. Correct. Yes. <laughs> and we're, we're only passionate about one. So before we get into... <laughs> before we get into those... We're going to share our sponsors, and we got uh, some new ones today. Well, this is also brought to you by Waking Up Early. It's the lesser known sponsor to sleeping in and usually (laughs) less preferred. But think of all the frugal things you can accomplish in the early hours of the day, like meal prepping, making your own coffee at home, or even starting that side hustle you're always talking to your friends about. Stop talking about it. Just do it. Waking Mm. up early. Initially, it sucks, but the payoff is good. Try it tomorrow. Yeah. Sleeping in wouldn't sponsor the show because we're not big enough. (laughs) Someday. Someday sleeping in will be the sponsor. We'll come up with a reason why that will be good. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. All right, y'all. Let's dive into this interview with Travis of studentloanplanner.com and also the Student Loan Planner podcast if you're more into podcasts, which you might be if you're listening to this one. Hey guys, we are with Travis Hornsby from Student Loan Planner. Thank you so much for coming on, Travis. Thanks for having me on, Jen and Jill. Yeah, it's so exciting to have you. I know this is a big topic on a lot of people's minds. I think a lot of our listeners as well. So we're really getting into the weeds today with Mm -hmm. you. So just to dive right in, Travis, can you tell us a little bit about what you do at Student Loan Planner, how you got into it? Why is student loans something that's on your radar even? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's it's because of love. So my wife had a bunch of student loan debt and we started to have that money conversation you have when you're kind of getting serious about somebody and you're like, hey, I want to know mm-hmm. if you have 50,000 of credit card debt you're not telling me about, right? So, <laughs> ah, so yeah. we had that conversation <laughs> and then, oh, by the way, she had six figures of, of med school debt, which, you know, I mean, that is normal. 
Like, I didn't know that at the time, but that's like super normal. You married a doctor, though? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm rolling in it, you know, because. All right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's really funny, actually. So so because that's tied into how Student Loan Planner became like even more legit of a thing. So I started trying to use my bond trader Excel skills because I was a bond trader in my prior life. And so managing money for very wealthy people, right? And uh, mm-hmm. like for one of the world's largest investment companies. So like super into like, you know, VBA programming, and all those things. And I was like, oh, okay, this is like, I'm going to make a spreadsheet. And it's going to show her all the different options she can pay back her debt with. And it's going to be so easy. And so I did that. And I was like, wait a second, there's this like loan forgiveness thing. You can like refinance all these different companies. You know, you can go for like, you know, different programs count for this loan forgiveness and different ways don't like, what is this? Right. So then I realized right. it was like way more complex than I thought it was. And then we sent in our certifications and like they didn't even count like a lot of her credit. And then I found out that she consolidated and made like an $80,000 mistake. And I was just thinking, this, oh, is, no. this is terrible. Like this is ridiculous. Like why should her, she have gotten, you know, screwed over with like this whole loan stuff? Like, like this is wrong. Yeah. And then I kind of got yeah. to thinking, well, you know, I don't really love like helping rich people get a bunch more money anyway. So um, I'm going to just quit. And I, at the time, like wanted to do early retirement thing, right? So I traveled for about a year and a half on and off different places, like 40 different countries. And Whoa. the thing that caused Student Loan Planner to happen initially was I, I made that spreadsheet and I, I shared it on, on, and it got picked up on Business Insider and the front page of Yahoo. And all these people started downloading it and asking me questions, even though I didn't really have like a full-time consulting business at that point, because they were just, there was such a big need. And then, yeah. you know, I started doing that just like for friends and family and random people that reached out after seeing that email and then I like asked permission for, uh, you know, from her dad to like to marry her because, you know, I'm raising this house kind of like how they talk to you things mm-hmm. right or wrong. And so <laughs> I, I'm sitting across from him like, can I marry your daughter? And he's like, no. I'm like, what? Uh-oh. I was like, oh, shoot. Nice. Yeah, exactly. Yikes. This is not how it went in the Lifetime movie. And. So, uh-uh. <laughs> so I'm sitting there. I'm like, okay. Or Hallmark. Yeah, exactly. A Hallmark. Yeah. So I'm like, so why? Right. <laughs> so what's your reasoning? And he's like, you don't have an income. Like she's, you know, they her parents are, are, you know, first generation immigrants from Hong Kong. He's like, you know, we call, uh, you know, men who, who don't have an income when their wife works, we call them eaters of soft white rice. And I, I didn't know what that meant, but I thought it was pretty bad. So Ooh, said, that you know, sounds bad. That doesn't sound like the type of person you want to be. No, but it sounds no. better than hard white rice. So like, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't sound super bad. I mean, I don't know. I, I think rice is pretty tasty personally. So, yeah. you know, so, so I'm talking to him and you say, okay, so what's your problem? Like, you know, uh, I have a very positive net worth and your daughter has a very negative net worth. I love her anyway. So like together, maybe our net worth is like, you know, merely positive. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know, so yeah, I don't have Balance. an income. Yeah. I don't have an income, like a big income because it, that's by choice. Like I don't want to make an income right now. I don't need an income. Uh, you know, cause I was very lucky to have saved a whole lot, have like a 70% savings rate back when I was a bond trader. So anyways, he's like, well, if you, if you want my blessing, you know, you'll prove, uh, you'll prove that you, you know, have the potential to make a high income to kind of, you know, be an economic security blanket for my daughter, just in case she needs it. Like that was his kind of reasoning. Whoa. It was kind of like old school a little bit, but I think super dad, super dad, like very super dad. dad. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was super, <laughs> he basically gave me like, I don't know if y'all watched the bachelor last night, but it's, you know, like the, the, the Cassie's dad treatment. Like, I don't think you're ready. And I'm like, Oh shoot. You know? And you know, but it was just you know Asian American <laughs> style. Right. So like you don't have a high enough income. I don't know. So I'm, I'm just joking. Now, now we have like this amazing relationship. They love me. I love them. You know, but it's uh, so that's hope yeah. to anybody listening. You know, if you if you're trying to win over your future in laws, <laughs> your but, father-in-law. But yeah, right? so so that just motivated <laughs> me to basically say, okay, like the student loan thing, like I want to really treat it like a business. And so I really started focusing on what is the value. You know, how can I help people in a way that's transparent, that's that's affordable, that you know, is just is very consumer centric. And so then I got so busy where I was doing like ten or eleven consults a day. You know, so I was working you know, like 15, 16 hours a day, just doing loan consults. I didn't have any time to produce any content. So it's like, this isn't sustainable. And I had, right. a, 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 you know, some people that I knew, CFP kind of folks, I was like, Hey, you know, why don't you come and help me out with this? And you do consults with me. And so then I started hiring other consultants with, with the business. And so we make custom plans for people who owe 50,000 to a million in student loan debt. And we wow. figure out how they get out of debt the best way, and we charge a flat fee for that. So that's what the business wow. is. The other piece of the business is for people that obviously need to refinance. We're not trying to charge them fees for getting an answer that's obvious. Like if you know that you need to refinance, like mm-hmm. most of the business, the way they do it is they just have you just like 
click on their links, and they get a big uh, commission out of it, right? So we give anywhere from half to 75% of the commission to the reader if they go through the links in our sites, that's a cashback bonus instead of taking all of it. So I do that basically because I want to have the best links for people to use so the conflict of interest isn't heavily there. So yeah, so we have two, that's awesome. Yeah, so we have two parts of our business, giving away a lot of that commission back to the readers, a lot of the people who don't even hire us, and then we have the part where we make the plans for people. I would say probably 75% of those people that hire us are people that you know, really need to be going for some sort of forgiveness strategy and are okay. just trying to get, you know, confirmation that's the right thing to do. So that's, mm-hmm. that's the business overall. And, and actually, uh, it's exciting. So I have a consult right after this interview and it's going to help us. We're going to pass the half billion of student loan mark that we've made plans for. So that's pretty exciting. Whoa. Wow. That is exciting. I mean, very depressing, but exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's, it's ex- 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 excite pressing. I don't know. What's the word, you know, yeah. it's, it's, that's it. That's excite pressing. Yeah. It's, it's terrifying <laughs> that, you know, a group of relatively small number of people could within a couple of years, you know, impact that big of a loan amount because that's mm-hmm. how bad the problem is out there. Right. And the, the flip side of yeah. that is those are people about 2000 people that are going to have a way less anxiety, you know, uh, late in future because of us mm-hmm. giving them the knowledge base that they needed to live their lives in a free way. Yeah. Yeah. So you are undoubtedly in my mind, the student loan forgiveness expert. I was vaguely familiar with what student loan planner did. And so normally when we get pitched by PR firms for people, I'm like, that's, you don't listen to the show. You have no clue who comes on here, but <laughs> When I heard that you wanted to be on our show, I was like, I don't care if he doesn't know what our show is. Like, this is something that we need to talk about Mm -hmm. because there are so many options for student loan forgiveness that it's hard to decipher. Like, what are the main types that are going to be most available to most people for federal student loans? And like, how do they differ? I guess there's maybe like four or five main ones, but like which ones are going to be most available to people that they should focus on? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question, Jen. So, so like, here's how I think your listeners can think about this. There's the one for the public servants and there's the one for everybody Mm -hmm. else, right? So the one for public servants is the one called public service loan forgiveness. So that's the one that's heavily in the media because that's the one that's starting to happen now. So that's the one people are paying attention to, right? Mm -hmm. The media is very like what's happening today. Right. And so that's that's the one that's happening currently because you need 10 years to get it. Mm. And the loan program passed in 2007. It wasn't really set up to even be possible to get it until like 2008. You need a minimum of 10 years of credit to get it. So 2018 is the very first year you really could have got it. And, you know, what you're seeing is like before 2010, the program was just it was almost impossible to get signed up for this thing. It was very, very Mm -hmm. difficult. So, you know, for that reason, that's why you're seeing such a high rejection rate right now is because the program was set up to fail Mm -hmm. basically before like 2010 Mm -hmm. when things kind of got ironed out and people figured out how to use it. So everybody until 2010 that's getting it, you know, or I should say everybody until 2020, because that's 10 years after 2010, everybody up until that point just going to be like somebody who had like a PhD in student loan bureaucracy that just like knew how Mm -hmm. to do everything Mm -hmm. perfectly, right? And so like most people don't, most people are just like, Hey, I worked somewhere for 10 years. It's like public service. Like I'm going to mm-hmm. apply. And so that's why people are getting rejected in mass right now. So there's this big misconception that this program isn't going to be around. It's absolutely going to be around. It's, it's definitely going to be there for the people that, you know, follow the rules and follow mm-hmm. the directions. But the problem is you have to follow the directions. <laughs> and so the, what's going to happen is, is if you work at a not-for-profit or government employer full-time, you just need 10 years worth of cumulative income-driven payments that, that's equal to 120 monthly payments, basically. Mm-hmm. You can't rush it. You can't you know, kind of get there faster. Mm-hmm. You got to do 120 monthly payments. It doesn't have to be consecutive. It can be cumulative. So you can you know, go back and forth between different jobs, right? But when you hit that mark, your loans are forgiven tax-free. That is wonderful, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It sounds wonderful. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it sounds wonderful. And, and people are getting it. I've gotten multiple emails from people that have, have gotten this program. I've gotten people that actually overpaid and they got refunds from the government. Whoa. So one woman in particular, mm. she got 16 payments refunded to her and 16 checks that she got to deposit at her bank, like from the U.S. Treasury. Whoa. That's pretty amazing. Okay. Right. So so there's this is a thing. It's happening. And the the reality is, is if you're set up to benefit for it, you're going to get it. And if, and if you're not, then you won't, it's in your promissory note. The, the thing that you signed that, you know, 
agreed to the terms of the loan has public service loan forgiveness in it. Okay. So, you know, every expert that I talk to say that it's pretty well impossible for them to take this away for people that currently have That's debt. good to hear. For people that are not in a program yet, for people who are not in medical school or dental school, whatever they're, you know, mm-hmm. going to law school, if you're not in a program yet, they could take it away. Mm. So that's something that I would really kind of think about is before you go to a, a grad school program, know what's in your promise right now mm. by just literally reading mm. it. Okay. So look in there and see if it's in there. So that's the first kind of loan forgiveness, right? And that's the kind that's for about 25% of the workforce. That's the percent of people that could use okay. that. Now, that's always a better option than refinancing in, in most cases for anybody that has more than like 30,000 of loans. You know, if you have less than that, probably you just pay it off. But but for the people that are not in that world, right? Like that's most of us, right? You know, like the, you know, the, the podcast entrepreneurs of the world, <laughs> you know, your, your private, you know, private employee employers, yeah. right? And, and, you know, your, your small business owners, what, mm-hmm. what, what about for them? Like, what if mm-hmm. I have a small legal practice that I'm just trying to run myself and I've got like 200,000 of law school debt, right? right? So, so for people who are not employed by a government or not-for-profit, then that's the, it's called IDR forgiveness, income-driven forgiveness. And this is the one for everybody else. So this one, you're using the same repayment plans as the first loan forgiveness option, but you just have to pay for 20 or 25 years instead of 10. Okay? okay. So that's fairly straightforward. The other catch is that at the end of the 20 to 25 years, you have to pay income tax on the forgiven balance as if you got a bonus on that entire forgiven balance. So if you have a $500,000 loan balance, you're going to get taxed as if that's a 500K bonus, and you'll have to pay the IRS 200 grand Whoa. 20 to 25 years from now. That sounds terrible. In reality, most people could prepare for that by putting $500 a month or more away into a brokerage account. Mm-hmm. So there's ways to manage this, and that's mm-hmm. what we obviously specialize in figuring out. Mm-hmm. But you know, for forgiveness, what we find is that the PSLF thing is amazing. If you qualify for that, you should do it. And then for the non-version, the, the non-PSLF version, the one that's available to everybody, you should generally do that if you're household debt to income ratio is above one and a half to one. So if you have more than 1.5 times your income, if you're making 100K and you owe more than 150K in student loan debt, then that forgiveness thing in the private sector is a good option, right? If you mm-hmm. if you owe less than that, refinancing, it's probably better. And then for the, the PSLF option, you, know, you, you probably want to go for that unless you just owe a really tiny amount of money. Those are the two big loan forgiveness programs. There's other, obviously other ones that are out there. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll say that a lot of them are duplicative. Like in particular, like the, the, there's this teacher loan forgiveness one that's like almost useless, mm-hmm. and yet and and yet like it's so terrible because like teachers sign up for it because it's literally called teacher loan forgiveness. Yeah. But the max they can get is like five thousand or seventeen thousand five hundred, and the max of PSLF is unlimited, and you can't count time for both programs simultaneously. Ooh, so like, yeah, yeah, it's, that's terrible, right? So it's like, mm-hmm. so you know, there's there's other loan forgiveness programs. In my experience, you really like need to start the conversation by talking about those first two that I talked about. The Mm -hmm. other ones, a lot of times, can not even be in your interest to do. We know New Year's resolutions often don't stick. In fact, on average, they last around 30 days. So if saving money is on your 2024 resolution list, here's a foolproof way to stick to yours. Switch your phone provider to Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for $15 a month. For those of you paying close to 40 bucks a month for just one phone line, this means a savings of $300 over the course of the year. We especially like Mint because all plans come with unlimited talk and text and high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash frugal. That's mintmobile.com slash frugal. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash frugal. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing. And of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. 
So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash strategic. That's oracle.com slash strategic. oracle.com slash strategic. Right. It sounds very daunting. And it, for you, someone who's an expert in the field who has spent so much time researching this and creating programs around it. I mean, imagine for the person who's just like, I just graduated. Yeah. Ooh, I got my degree. Oh, my word. That was real money that I now have to pay yeah. back. Like, how would so what would be some of those first steps that somebody could take in figuring out the loan forgiveness, but also like just debt repayment? What would be some first steps people can take? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, so the first thing you need is an emergency fund. If you don't have an emergency fund, then you're going to wreck your finances. So it's mm. at some point because something's going to mm-hmm. happen. If you don't mm-hmm. have an emergency fund, you're eventually going to have a transmission blow out or you're going to have a roof that needs to get repaired or you're going to have, you know, some sort of daycare expense that you got to pay for. And yeah. if you don't have an emergency fund, then you're going to be turning to credit card debt. And hey, student loans is 7%, but yeah, credit mm-hmm. card's 25%, right? Wow. Yeah. So, I would just say this, that as soon as you graduate with your student loans, you're probably going to have mostly federal student loans. If you go to studentloans.gov, all you got to do is log in. It's It might be a little confusing, but like, you know, like anything that, you know, says like, forgot my password, like you can figure it out. Like it just might take a little while of like reset <laughs> passwords, right? So just force <laughs> yeah. your way, force your way into studentloans.gov. Once you're in there, you'll see a spot where you can consolidate your loans. So if you are graduating and you know you just finished, then you can consolidate those loans and get signed up for the revised pay as you earn plan. Mm-hmm. So that plan is, in most cases, can, you can get a zero dollar a month payment if you do it right after you graduate. So zero dollars a month, I think people can afford that, right? So yeah, you right. get that for like twelve months, like after you graduate, and during those twelve months you have no excuse why you can't get an emergency fund of at least three times your monthly expenses. Get a job, get an emergency mm-hmm. fund. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, get the emergency fund. You got the emergency fund, things are going to work out okay now. Mm-hmm. So because you can either refinance and you're, you're comfortable refinancing because you got the emergency fund to take care of anything bad that happens, or you're going to go for forgiveness because you should be going for that anyway, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. that would be the first thing that people can do to set themselves up on the right foot. And I love that before we were kind of turn on the recording, we were talking about like how y'all talk about limiting the big expenses. That's, you know, and and you also joked about not being experts. So that sounds like the most expert advice <laughs> I've ever heard. Because, because let me tell you, like out of the like 12 or 1300 plans I've done personally, the two biggest problems I see are car and housing expense. Mm-hmm. And it's not even close. Like those two things will single-handedly wreck someone's budget. Yeah. And if, if people want to live without a budget, it's pretty easy. Like have a paid off car and have a house payment that's like where the price is less than two times your joint income. So if mm-hmm. you do those two things, what what I have found is that if you're frugal in the big areas, that frugality is going to trickle down to like other other parts of your life. I don't know, like trickle down frugality. Yeah. Maybe I should like. Yeah. <laughs> Coin you know. that phrase. Yes. <laughs> and you can find links to our housing and transportation episodes in the show notes. <laughs> okay, there we go. Yeah, so, so, so trickle down frugality is the thing. And, and so what I also joke about is like, hey, you know, you could drink Starbucks and lattes until your liver fails. You're not going to save as much money as if you cut your car and housing payments lower. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, so that's just where the big, you know, changes happen. So if you can limit your housing and car expenses, then at the very worst scenario, your your debt is kind of like a tax. Mm-hmm. And it's a tax where you lose 10% of your income. Mm-hmm. Well, hey, if you if you're gonna go to a bachelor's degree and make like 50, so add in like 10% on top of that. So now you're at 55. Like if you went to a graduate program and you're making over 55K, then that was a good financial decision, even if you took out like a bazillion dollars, because you're mm-hmm. just paying a percentage of your income. And then you're going to have to pay the income tax bomb in the future. But like, if you want to just kind of account for that too, then instead of 10% more, say it's like 15 or 20% more. So instead of making like 55K, maybe you need to make 60K with your grad degree. So if you're going to make like even a little bit more with that grad degree, you you can go to a program that like by traditional standards looks like a freaking scam Mm -hmm. and you can actually make the economics work. Now, I want to, you know, say that I do not at all recommend you do that as a (laughs) Like, you know, I, I get, I get people all the time that are reaching out and I'm like, they're like, you know, I want to be, 
you know, I want to be a chiropractor and, and uh, I'm going to make a lot of money. And I'm like, okay, first of all, like you'll probably make 50 to $70,000 and you're going to graduate with 250 K of debt. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. will that work out? Like, could I probably like finagle that into being a financially sustainable, good life? Yes. But it's probably a terrible decision to do that, Mm -hmm. you know? And so that's one thing that's kind of really frustrating is, um, you know, a lot of schools just like blatantly lie. Yeah. You know, like it's, it's kind of unreal. I don't know if you'll have any thoughts about that. I went to one of those schools. I just, I'll put my hand up right now. You can't see it, but I went to one of those schools. I had a girl reach out to me yesterday on Instagram saying she saw that I went to um, this acupuncture school and what I thought about it. And I was like, the school's great, but you're not going to make enough to pay back your student loans. You're not going to make what they tell you you're going to make. Mm-hmm. I had to do yeah. so many other things besides mm-hmm. acupuncture to pay back the loans that I mm-hmm. took out to get the degree. Yeah. I've always yeah. thought that there should be like a sliding scale for what you're getting your degree in. Like, why does a social work degree cost as much as a business degree? <laughs> like, right. Yeah. We're not making the same thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I was, you know, it's just like, so, so, so this is some of the stuff that I hear. So like, they'll use old statistics. So like part of it is like administrators will like lie without actually lying, you know, like they, (laughs) Mm -hmm. they can claim plausible deniability, right? Like it's kind of like a, a Reagan or Rand Contra lie. Like, Oh, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I mean, so, so it's kind of like a, it's a thing where, you know, if you use statistics from like 2007 Mm -hmm. and you use those average debt statistics and then you use the incomes from back then. Yeah. Like you can possibly say like, Oh yeah, our grads were paying it back. Right. And so, yeah, people pay it back in like seven years. Like, for example, this one dental school, uh, like I know for a fact, like so many people have told me their administrators tell them that they, people pay back the debt in an average of seven years. But to pay back the debt, the average debt in 10 years would take incomes that are greater than 100% of what people earn after graduation. So Jeez. I know flat out that that's a lie. Yeah. But the, the reason why I think that they're able to like mentally say that is because they're using data that's old. So then they can just kind of like, in their minds, I guess, get away with it, you know? And so if you look at like some of these other schools, like there's tons of pressure that these schools are under to perform Mm -hmm. and the deans and the university presidents get Mm -hmm. large bonuses. Now they didn't used to get. And a lot of those bonuses are dependent upon revenue and performance for the college. And I have even had conversations with like high level administrators and and I I can't say their names because they asked to be off the record. And they're basically like, yeah, like the money's there. And, you know, we can charge the tuition because there's no cap on, on, on borrowing now. So since 2006, there, you can borrow Whoa. an unlimited amount. There's no, there's no cap with the new federal loan system. So the schools figure that out and they they can borrow up to the cost of attendance for schools now. So the, the schools are like, okay, well, so then we'll just raise our cost of attendance to like infinity and beyond. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so that's what's happening. And the reason why, you know, students haven't like freaked out yet is because you have capped payments that are a percentage of your income. So if your payments are a percentage of your income, you're never going to feel the full cost, right? So if you graduate from acupuncture school with 250K of debt, instead of paying 2,500 a month, where you'd have like mass protests and pitchforks and like burning torches, right? You have like payments of like 500 a month. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of why nobody is like freaking out yet. And so the only thing that would stop this would be what's happening in like pharmacy right now. So like, for example, pharmacists, their acceptance rate for pharmacy school went from 31% in 2005 to about 83% today. So now if you have a pulse, you can get into pharmacy school. Wow. What that's done to incomes is incomes have gone from like 120K to like a 80 or 90K average. So that's incomes now are, actually. are falling. Yeah. So like think about what happened to law schools, right? Like law schools, you had that big like legal recession where like way more people were like, hey, you're not going to get a legal job. Don't go to law school. So it's the salaries in the job market that prevented people from going in. Right now, like the job market's pretty good. Like the economic expansion's hopping, right? Everybody can get jobs or a lot of people can. It's like everybody just kind of running into all these programs. So it's uh, it's pretty wild out there. And like, I just hope that some of these schools eventually get held to account for what they're doing. Yes. Wow. Now that we're sufficiently depressed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It is. It's a, it's a whole problem. Thankfully, there's people who are like seizing the the occasion to really get serious about their debt and get rid of it. But yeah, for those thinking about going to school, this is a big deal to mm-hmm. consider in what you want to do with your future. If you've already done it, you're in it, and now you're like head down gazelle pace trying to get at it, then it is possible. But yeah, it's a problem. Yeah. We have some listeners struggling with um, 
they're in like an income driven program. They're set up. They're at a PSLF qualified workplace and they've got, you know, those loans, maybe not like $250,000, but uh, God bless you if that's you. But they know that they could be making more if they weren't working for the government or for a nonprofit, like doing the same thing in the private sector. So how do you balance that? Like, like, what do I do? Do I stay for the PSLF, make a little bit less? Or do I go out into the private sector and, and make more? Like, how do you counsel people on dealing with that decision? I mean, I'll, I'll give the one size fits all answer, which is actually like, in my experience, a really good answer. You should do what makes you happy. So if Mm -hmm. you are like, man, I want to make more money and have more dynamic career opportunities. And man, I'm tired of using this like, you know, email database from like 2001, (laughs) you know, and like, you know, like all the stuff that the, you know, the government kind of jobs come with, right. Then like, yeah, you should do the private sector job. And if you're like, Hey, I love doing public service and I love helping people and having great vacation and sick leave and, you know, all these benefits. And I love my coworkers and the fact that it's not high pressure and like really focus on, you know, profits and everything then you should continue in that job and you shouldn't feel bad about making less money. So the reason for that is I calculate like a break even for clients. And so like the break even, I try to tell them like what PSLF is worth is as if it was like an annual bonus. Mm. So for example, I can say that like, Hey, this is going to be like earning an extra 10 K a year. And you know, with your government job. So like a private sector job would be like 70 K plus 10. So that'd be 80, mm. you know? And so those two jobs you'd be financially indifferent between so if you can get an 80K private sector job, you're exactly the same place you're at. Mm-hmm. And what I typically find is like the extra income you can make in the private sector is often quite similar to the income that you're making, you know, adjusted for that loan forgiveness benefit in the public sector for a lot of people out there. And so then you just have to pick the one that makes you happiest. Mm-hmm. And, you know, two, I'd say that you want to make sure that you adjust for the hours worked too, because I've had some scenarios where it was kind of like a wash but one private sector job would ask this guy to work like 55 hours a week and the government job, he'd be working 40. Mm-hmm. So, you you know, you kind of want to adjust it for like number of hours, lifestyle, and then make the decision that's best for you and your family. And I promise you like 90% of the time, you know, you, you'll be able to choose either one. Mm-hmm. That's good advice. Mm-hmm. I didn't think you were going to give good advice on that one, but you surprised me again. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh yeah. No, bring it. You know, actually I got, I got even better advice. So let's say like you want to just totally dodge your student loans. Right. And you're just tired of America and you're like, screw this. Like, I just want to get the heck out of here. <laughs> so the best thing you can do is marry like an Australian or like a New Zealander or, you know, somebody in like, you know, a foreign country. Like, so I'll give you an example. Like this one guy, uh, he's living in Dubai right now and he's a dentist. And so Dubai, they, they have uh, no income tax there. And two, there's something called the foreign earned income tax exclusion, which means you can exempt like 100K of income mm-hmm. and not put it on your taxes and it's totally legit. So if you live in like France, right, and you're being like a social worker in France, then your US income could be zero. And then your payment is based on your US income. So it could be zero. Right? What? I don't have My to blown. wait. Do you have to marry somebody from that place or can you just move there? You can move there. You don't have to marry somebody. It's just a lot easier. Okay, you know, good. I already have a husband. I don't think I can do more than one. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I mean, if it's worth it. No, I'm just kidding. So, you know. Eric's a lot. I, I don't know if she could handle more than one. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, so, so it like, you know, but what you could do is get permanent residency, right? Or you could get like another, you know, like passport somehow, like figure out some sort of special program and immigrate somewhere. Like I actually have a group of, of clients in, in Australia and New Zealand that like a lot of them are like weirdly it's like veterinarians or something. I think like they, they meet people in vet school and they're like, take me away from like my giant <laughs> death, you know? And, and so like, you know, so they so they go so they go down there and like, yeah, they have like four hundred thousand in debt, but they're paying zero a month. Whoa, and instead, it's, it's, this it's is gonna be cold. the new trend. We gotta yeah, do a whole other episode just on this. After, I mean, they're they're living over there with zero payments. Do they have to come back and deal with it one day? Well, if you're legally handling it, then you don't have to, right? And so eventually the debt would be forgiven. You'd have to pay income tax on that. But then there's something called the insolvency exclusion. So if you have what forgiven debt and your assets are less than your liabilities, then under current IRS code, your debt is forgiven tax-free. So there's all kinds of ways to deal with this. You don't have to default or you don't have to freak out or just feel like trapped. 
you know, there was this case in CNBC. This guy was like talking about how student loans made him so stressed. He just like moved to a jungle in India. And like he had a picture of him like riding a, an elephant. And he's like, I feel so great, even though I know my credit's trash. Like, I don't want to come home because I wouldn't be able to even open like a bank account, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, dude, this guy, not only could he not be trashing his credit and like compounding his interest and all this stuff, he could be getting zero dollar a month payments and his interest would be cut in half if he was on the repay program. So there so, is a way to yeah. run away from your problems and for your that. problem to solve itself. Yeah, we have we have like a student loan plan article. That is what about, we were hoping to find out. Yeah, it's like how to flee the country with student loans, and it's. I'm legal. gonna put that in our show notes. I love <laughs> yeah. it. Someone's gonna take yeah. this option. Someone's yeah, gonna listen com- to this episode and do it. If it's completely legal, we completely support it. So. Yeah, I mean, the, they might you know they might close it, in which case you might have to adopt your new country, right? Yeah. But uh, hey, you know, probably my ancestors were probably like locked up in like, you know, an Irish poorhouse or something. They're like, I'm tired of being in debt. I'm going to go to America. Right. So maybe, right. you know, maybe, maybe some other people need to start thinking like that too. Right. I'm just joking around, but like the, the thing is, is, you know, debt can cause tons of anxiety and tons of stress. Oh, on people. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like I get, I get like, and then some of the extreme examples, like I get people that are contacting me that I have to refer to like the national suicide hotline, you know? So it spans the gamut of like, Hey, this is stressful. Wow. Like this is destroying my life. Right. Yeah. And, so the, the thing that people need to realize is like, hey, there's all these creative options, right? Like who knew that you could just literally move to like New Zealand and like never have to deal with your debt, right? I mean, you know, who knew that you could get on an income driven program and pay like way less, you know, and it's actually okay. And the main thing that's going to determine your financial success is just the fact that you, you, you know, you actually have a high savings rate. Yeah. So like, you know, I've been building this tool to try to like show people this too within my calculator. That's like, hey, if you go for forgiveness and you make sure you have a high savings rate, then what will happen is your assets will be like three times your your student loan debt. And then at some point, they'll like kind of solve the student loan debt crisis, right? You know, and, and then you'll have a really positive net worth. And so I even have like a strategy too, where people die with their debt. That sounds like really depressing. Huh. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I hate to say it like this, but like, let me just paint an example. So say someone's got 150,000 or 200,000 of parent plus loans and they're 70 years old because their kids like went to like private Catholic school, right? So that mom or dad, like instead of just like delaying retirement just forever to pay like 1500 a month on her loans, on the loans until like, you know, 80, 80, what you can do instead is if you max social security, then you can use like this loophole where social security is not really considered, you know, in your income, if it's, you know, below a certain level, mm-hmm. it's actually really high. It's a lot higher than you think. And then you can pay zero a month on that for 25 years and then you have to pay income tax. And if you pass away, then the debt's forgiven tax free. So what you could do is if you're frugal and you listen to the Frugal Friends podcast, right? And you're just like the one seventy year old that listens to you know this like happening podcast. I don't I don't want to offend anybody if that's you. Like, I think we got a couple yeah. seventy year olds that oh, listen to us. We're seventy years stay, old at stay, heart. Stay young so, at heart. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah well, it's, yeah, yeah. Stay twenty at heart, seventy year olds. But you know, so that person could, you know, if they live until ninety five and past that, they'd get, probably get a disability discharge. If they pass away before that then it would be discharged tax-free. And that 150, 200K is something that now can get forgiven instead of paid back. Wow. So there's like, you know, this this loophole with like the moving overseas, the dying with your debt and taking it with you, you know, because you don't take, the thing is you don't take your assets with you, but they don't tell you they don't, you don't take your debts either. (laughs) So you have to, you know, you have to be creative with it, right? That's amazing. We joke about some of this stuff, but it is, it's important to note that there's such an emotional like a mental aspect to paying back debt because I had that, Mm -hmm. I had that severe anxiety when I had my debt. Mm -hmm. And just to know, to be assured that it's not the end of the world. You can always move to Australia and (laughs) maybe just keep that in the back of your head. And it just makes a little, makes it a little lighter. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be something that rules your mental capacity. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Travis, you've taken us through some a lot of non-traditional ways of dealing with debt. Are there any other even lesser known but m- more understood programs that could offer loan forgiveness? Something maybe better than P- PSLF programs or Yeah, I mean there there's there's something called NHSC loan forgiveness. This is a program where if you're a health professional working in an underserved area, they'll pay I think it's like 25,000 a year towards your loans or something like that. I had to look up to be sure. But then there's okay. another one called National Institute of Health, you know, loan forgiveness. There's like a whole bunch of them for health professionals in particular. Okay. 
Uh, there's like there's Perkins loan cancellation. Um, there's some various programs for specific states. So we have like a, a list of some of them on the blog that are out there that, you know, if you are a, you know, a teacher in a certain area, if you're, you know, a certain kind of professional, in a certain area, a lot of them are tied to some sort of, you know, serving underserved populations, mm -hmm. which kind of makes sense. You know, your, your employer might have an employer assistance program to pay student loans. That's becoming more popular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's, there's definitely options out there. I, I think that the, uh, best path though is to kind of rely on your own self to get out of debt if you're not going to get forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So like the, the probably the majority of people are not going to get any forgiveness. That's one thing that I think we should kind of say because the majority of borrowers actually have you know about well the the majority have less than forty thousand of debt, and the the population that has you know six figures is actually only about five to six percent of the total student loan borrowers. Mm -hmm. So. If you have that like typical undergrad debt, you probably need to pay it back. Like I'm, um, I apologize. <laughs> I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but yeah, you probably got to get rid of it. And the good news is like 40k is a lot, but it's kind of like uh, an F150 purchase you wish you could take back. You know what I mean? It's like it's a car mm -hmm. payment. It's yeah. not like it's a mortgage, and people mm -hmm. pay off car payments all the time. So mm -hmm. for for that situation, you know, you can refinance and you can refinance twice. Right. Mm -hmm. So you could do like a refi and get a five hundred dollar bonus, do like a ten year payment and like four hundred a month, and you can pay more than what you owe. Mm -hmm. And then that'll knock down your balance faster than what the stated loan schedule says. And you'll knock down forty K to like twenty K and then you could refinance again with a different company and get another five hundred bucks. And yeah. then you could do a payment that's four hundred bucks, but then that would get you out of debt in five years instead of ten years. So, you know, if you're making those extra prepayments, you get down from forty to twenty. Now you could cut down that 10 year schedule down to like six or seven years total. Mm -hmm. So like there's, that's called a refinancing ladder. So okay. you know, a refinancing ladder is when you refinance multiple times to keep your payment manageable, but always keep lowering the interest rate. And then the, the other flip side to it is just, you know, live on, you know, the, the old live on rice and beans, beans and rice until you're mm -hmm. done that. like, Hey, if you're like, if you got 20, 30 K you're coming out, like I paid two, like, I think 300 a month living in like the Philadelphia area for my first job uh, mm -hmm. because we had a guy living in the attic. Nice. Was it great to live in the attic? Probably not, but I've got some great memories from it. Uh, <laughs> you know, like yeah, trying to get a, some of character. that soft, right, right, white yeah. rice with some yeah. beans, you oh, know? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you just got to live that frugal life, you know, like getting the, we had to climb the roof with the mattress to fit it in through the attic. And that was probably really stupid, you know, so. Got to do uh, what you got to do. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> but you know, but in reality, like paid off car, like $300 a month, like you're making 50K, which is like a typical after college income, you got mm -hmm. 20K of debt okay, like suck it up and pay it off. Right. I mean, if, if that's you, I don't want to sound like kind of mean or anything, but like empower yourself to like, just pay, like if you pay 2% of your debt amount every month, you'll be done in five years. If you yeah. pay four, 4%, 4 you'll be done in like less than like, probably around two years, you know? Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's, that's like a good rule of thumb. If you pay 1% of your debt amount every month, then you'll be done in 10 years. So like, you know, when you'll be out of debt, so just like throw tons of money at it and get rid of it. You know, I, I think that the only thing that comes before getting rid of your student loan debt, if you know you need to get rid of it, is putting money into your emergency fund and getting your retirement match. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another bumper sticker, suck it up and pay it off. <laughs> <laughs> except, do what you got to do. Yeah, dot to dot, except when you need to move to Australia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my word. Next best thing to moving to Australia, though, is, is our favorite time of the definitely week. Definitely. The, the Bill of the, of the Week. That's right. It's time for the best minute of your entire week. Maybe a baby was born and his name is William. Maybe you paid off your mortgage. Maybe your car died and you're happy to not have to pay that bill anymore. Duck bills, Buffalo bills, Bill Clinton. This is the Bill of the Week. Travis, every week we invite a listener or guest to share with us their favorite bill for the week. Whether that's lowercase, uppercase, whatever bill. Travis, do you have a bill of the week for us today? I sure do. And it wasn't even my bill. So this is kind of what happened. So we started tracking our spending on unitobudget.com. So maybe some of your mm -hmm. listeners are familiar with that. Yes. And love them. before, so I, I used to be 
so frugal that it, I did not need to budget at all because again, I was, I was seeding my soft white rice. I know you could buy that in bulk for like, you know, a dollar <laughs> per thousand pounds. And so yes. like, I didn't need to budget. Right. But then I got married and Hey, you know, you know, you, you kind of start spending more money, like things that you were willing to do when you were like 19 or like 21 or whatever, suddenly like Natty Light doesn't taste as good. Right. Mm-hmm. So, uh, she so wants something you know, on so top it, of that rice. Exactly. So <laughs> I noticed, I noticed we were spending a lot more money. So I, I like, we started tracking our spending more so we can know exactly like what we were spending in each category. And, and that was like good too. Cause like, mm-hmm. I don't know what she spends and she doesn't know what I spend. So now it's like a place where we can communicate with each other what's going on. So mm-hmm. one of the parts of this budgeting app is you have to like add in all of your expenses, you know, even if they're like brought in automatically, you have to like match them up to what your categories mm-hmm. are. So I was doing that mm-hmm. one night and I was like, dang, like we really spent a lot of money on Uber Eats this month. And, uh, and I was like looking at the expenses and there was like five different charges. And I was like, I don't even think we've ever used Uber Eats. And so then I asked, <laughs> you know, I asked my wife, I was like, did, did you order anything? And no, uh, you know, and I checked kind of my history. I didn't order anything. And I asked uh, our, uh, or, so it's kind of weird. Our best man lives with us right now. Okay. He's like our roommate, you know, save That's money, great. right? Save yeah. that money. Do so, it. <laughs> so I was thinking, okay, maybe he took my phone and, you know, and, and ordered Uber Eats. So I asked him to, he, he didn't do anything. And so we found $240 of, of somebody's, uh, you know, Korean barbecue ch- charges or whatever on our, <laughs> on our cards. And if I hadn't tracked him a unit of budget, like, I'm going to be honest, like I would not have noticed it because credit card expenses, oh, it's just like this long list. You don't have to like think about it that much. You just mm-hmm. see it, you just pay it off. I like, like to log in every couple of weeks and pay it off. And if I hadn't been tracking and you needed budget, then I would have, we would have literally just like given like some, you know, bro, like $240 of like Korean barbecue and Uber Eats for a bill that like I didn't even. Seriously. Buy. Yeah. You so, didn't even get to enjoy that Korean I barbecue. Know. It's terrible. And like, I think that that would buy you quite a bit of Korean right? barbecue. Because, you like know, we're in St. Louis. So. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's great. That was a big lesson learned that, you know, how are you going to know if somebody's out there like using your card if you're not even tracking in the budget app, like where it's going? Mm-hmm. How so, did they get your info? So uh, I'm a little scared that it could have something to do with me being a public, more public personality. Uh. But I think, I think probably really what happened was just like somebody kind of was making $15 an hour. We were kind of chilling at their restaurant. They might've taken a picture of our card, like real quick. Right. Like, I think that's probably what happened. I think somebody just kind of like got a little greedy and just took a quick, you know, picture of it. And, you know, and like St. Louis police has got bigger things to worry about than somebody getting a little bit of free chicken, you know? So, you know, if it was like thousands of dollars, they probably would investigate it. But I mean, it's like, it's not a big deal because credit card companies obviously just, you know, give it back to you pretty, pretty easily. They don't charge you for it. Um, yeah. It's not nearly as bad as like, I got money stolen from my debit card when I was in Mexico. And I actually had to go to like the Mexican police station and file a formal report. Cause you know, debit cards, you have to actually have the money deposited back in your account, which is way tougher than getting a charge canceled on your credit card. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's like a different rodeo, but that's my favorite bill. I, one, one more bill. That's like a, an actual bill. Ooh, it's yes. a bill of Congress. Yeah. So this this bill is the Higher Education Act, and it's being reauthorized as we speak. And yes. uh, it's going to change a lot of things about student loans. There's a mm. fairly high probability that it passes. I think that it'll grandfather everybody in on the current programs. It's the expectation. But there's a real good chance that it's going to dramatically alter the landscape for student loans for the next 10 years. So if you're, if you're a student loan borrower now and you want to protect what you have, reach out to your congressperson or your senator if you're going to school and you're like thinking about being a doctor and you're like the PSL program going away would be ruinous for me, reach out to your person mm-hmm. that's, you know, and tell them like, this is a very important program for me because whatever they write in the bill is going to be what's going to happen the next 10 years. And it's probably not going to get changed, you know, for another 10 years when they do it. So yeah. that, that bill is just the higher education act. Uh, it's just getting, you know, every 10 years it gets reauthorized they put it off for like 12 years or 10 or 11 12 years now. So it's overdue. So definitely uh, kind of keep tabs on that if you're interested in student loans. Man, nice. double bills and double greatness. Those were two <laughs> really good ones. And yeah, thanks, Travis. Y'all, if you think you can top that or get anywhere <laughs> close to it, visit us at frugalfriendspodcast.com slash bill 
and leave us your bill of the week. We got a few. If you haven't heard yours yet, it's coming. I promise. We're, we got a few in the queue. It's coming down the yes. line. It's never too late. Never too late to earn a degree. Never too late for a comeback. Between your busy career and taking care of a family, it can feel like there's never a good time to go back to school. But your time is now. Time to start your comeback with Purdue Global. As Purdue's online university for working adults, Purdue Global is dedicated to supporting adults like you who know it's time to earn the recognition you deserve. You have the experience. You have the knowledge. It's time to get credit for the work you've done. You can balance work, family, and everything in between while earning your degree. It's time to move forward in your career, for your family, and for yourself with a degree you're proud of, a degree that employers will recognize and respect. You're worth this investment in yourself to earn a degree you deserve. It's never too late. Never too late to go back to school and come back stronger with an education you can trust. Now is the time for your comeback. Start yours today at purdueglobal.edu. We all agree that reducing carbon emissions is a good thing. And once again, Toyota is leading the way. We hear a lot about fully electric vehicles and Toyota has them. With more on the way, but we also know a BEV is not for everyone. Whether it's because of cost, range, or concerns about finding a charging station when you need it. Plus, the raw materials used to manufacture batteries are limited. Enter Beyond Zero, Toyota's vision for a carbon neutral future. In vehicles and manufacturing plants too, in the years ahead. The materials used to make just one long range battery for an EV could be used to make batteries for six plug-in hybrids or 90 gas electric hybrids. That's why Toyota's position today is electrified diversified, empowering you to choose how to reduce your own carbon footprint with the vehicle that's right for you, a hybrid, plug-in hybrid or battery EV. So shop, learn more and get details at toyota.com slash beyond zero. Toyota, let's go places. But now it's time for our lightning round. Yes. Our lightning round that I like pew, 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 pew. just didn't prepare for today. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be fast, just like lightning. It's because I don't fully understand what the lightning round is yet. We change it every <laughs> Nobody week. does. And <laughs> nobody knows what the lightning round is. <laughs> so it's just shorter than the first part. That's it. It's shorter <laughs> than the first part, than the thunder round. So. Yeah. Yes. I have, I have a lightning question oh for you guys. Is it okay? Oh, <laughs> yeah, sure. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. Even turning the tables. Okay. Turn them. Okay. Would you Would you rather have an MD degree with four hundred thousand of debt or a JD degree with two hundred thousand of debt? Mm. Well, I don't think that I would want to ever be a lawyer. So, I think I would just have to go with my heart and take the MD. Jill. Um. Yeah. Less debt. <laughs> Always. <Less debt. laughs> but you have to Always read so answer. much yeah. and and argue all the time. So Jen, that's the exact <laughs> way you want to think about graduate degrees is like that you should go not for the money, right? You should go for what you want to do. I answered right. But ah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Jill. But but think about it this way. It's like what is your income gonna be? I had somebody with like four or five hundred thousand of debt, but she was an OBGYN in a rural area, she's making 400000 a year. Oh. And then I have a lawyer over here that's working as a associate, like a decent law firm, making ninety k a year, and he makes has 200000 of debt, yeah. right? So if you have a lot higher income, then having a lot higher debt is totally yeah. worth it. Uh, okay, flipping the tables again for the lightning round. Travis, you said you traveled for a year to like 40 different countries. What was your favorite? Where, I mean, you obviously probably don't have time to list all the places that you went, but what were your favorite explorations? Ukraine was my favorite because mm-hmm. anybody in America is a one percenter in Ukraine. And being huh. a one percenter mm. gives you a very different perspective on life, even if it's very temporary. It's like only for 10 days, right? Uh, that's how long I was in this one particular city in Lviv. And I loved it. I mean, Lviv and and um, and the capital Kiev were just amazing cities to be in mm-hmm. because a hostel, a super nice hostel with very clean everything, great internet, $5 a night. Whoa. Wow. And dinner at a place with like a swing band that was like playing in the mood. It's like four level brewery. You know, I had like a flight of beers and food and appetizers, dessert. 
a dollar fifty for that. Oh, Whoa. you know, and so, and it was good yeah. food. You didn't oh, get sick. It was amazing. It was just like really, really high quality. Now it was Ukrainian food. It, nothing was imported, right? Like so, anything that was imported, mm-hmm. you had to pay like the foreign currency price. But mm-hmm. anything that was in Ukraine dollars specifically, like the economy was a wreck at the time I was there. And, you know, the the exchange rate, which is out of control because of the war with Russia, you know, so I stayed in the part, obviously, that wasn't in the conflict mm-hmm. area. It's just it's just an exciting place to be. I, I really love the food, love awesome. the people. Um, I love that yeah. you're like. Uh, your standard was like how cheap the place was for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly, Which right. is what you got to experience. It's how my that. husband and I figure out where we're going to go is how cheap yeah. it can be. I think that's the, the secret to mm-hmm. like slow travel and, lo- and being able to afford to travel like for a super long time is just pick a place, like spend more time in the cheap places, exploring those and then go yeah. to the more expensive places, but just like spend just a for a little time bit. there. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's a good tip. Uh, and Travis, lastly, what do you have going on at Student Loan Planner? Where can people find more about you? What's happening what's over there? Yeah. So help at studentloanplanner.com. We'll get you in touch with one of our CFPs or CFAs, and you can just like spill your guts out and just tell us what's going on and what your stress is. And we'll tell you if we think that you should work with us or not. And then if you just want to learn more, I would just go over to the studentloanplanner.com site and just click on the blog and you can literally type in the search bar, like what you're interested in, or you can see mm-hmm. all the categories we have. So anything, you know, any kind of profession imaginable, we should have a category dedicated to you that you can read and get a lot of free stuff from. And of course, you know, there's the calculator that you can download. You even have an acupuncture section, which nobody does. <laughs> That's awesome. So you literally yeah. have every section. I mean, if you're not there... Send us an email. Tell me. Don't write exist. Something. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, we have almost everything like mm-hmm. emphasis on almost like every now and then pilots like rail, like flight, flight air traffic yeah. controllers will have like 200 grand of debt or like people that yeah. are like professional clowns. Like I'm not, I'm not kidding. Like any profession that you can imagine that could have a graduate degree attached to it often has a lot of debt. So yeah. um, I'm trying to think of like off the top of my head, like I've had like Jewish cantorists have like, 300k in debt and we were trying to figure out if they were like proselytizing at all because if you're proselytizing you don't qualify for PSLF and there's just so many weird interesting professions that I've run across doing this that have a lot of debt that's awesome well thanks so much for hanging out with us Travis this has been super fun off the rails on the rails so so good and I think people are going to get a lot out of it Mm -hmm. thanks Jen and Jill Jill, that was Mm. real good. That was Um, so good. And if I still had a ton of debt left, honest to goodness, Jen, I would have been the crazy one saying, yep, France, Australia, I don't care. Throw the dart. We're going. This is ridiculous. So that's fantastic. But also for those people who aren't going to be as dramatic as I am. There's some great options in there for you, too. I would not have done that. I did not do that. (laughs) Um, And and even I didn't go with student loan forgiveness, but I Mm -hmm. thought his insight on how to more easily discern what's going to be right for you Mm -hmm. was good. And I'm trying to remind people that paying off debt is so much more than math and income. There's a mental and an emotional aspect to it, and it never ever should make you feel hopeless or anxious yeah. um, or like you just don't want to live anymore. And if yeah. that is what you're feeling, then definitely talk to somebody about it. Like Jill. <laughs> yeah. Cause I'm a social worker. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's always hope and light at the end of the tunnel. Mm-hmm. Hopefully that's what people can walk away from this episode with because it can feel so overwhelming. And then to feel like there's so many different options and you've got to read all the fine print and what does this mean for me and all the lingo and the jargon that there are experts out there who can help you. But then mm-hmm. there's also just the chipping away at it. It can... Yep happen for you. So yeah, it's, it is a broken system. We recognize that, but there are, there's a whole community of support and friends around you to help you pay off that debt and live a really fantastic, uh, life with your finances. And if you need more friends that are trying to pay off their debt, head over to frugalfriendspodcast.com slash group. There's Mm -hmm. a whole group, a big group. And 
we're all frugal and supportive and there are no dumb questions in our group. No. So come hang out with us. And uh, if you want to hear more from Travis, again, check him out on Student Loan Planner Podcast or on his website. And if you just need something else to do after you've done all of those things, we are reading Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill this April. Mm. And we're still doing the giving away free copies. So if you want to enter to win a free copy of this book, Think and Grow Rich, leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher, screenshot the review, and email it to us at frugalfriendspodcast at gmail.com. We will select the winners at the end of the month. One in every five reviews for the month gets a book. Those are good odds. Yes. Yes. And if you want an example of a very helpful review that will help strangers uh, figure out if they want to be our frugal friends or not, Mm. here's a really good one. It's from Sarah and it's topped with five stars and it says, like frugal soul sisters. I decided 2019 was the year I finally get my finances in check. One of the ways that helps me is listening to smart personal finance podcasts that align with the choices I need to make. Mm. Listening to these ladies dish about all the different ways I can change my spending and be frugal without giving up the fun in my life. It's been a lifesaver and has helped me stay on track. I highly recommend this to anyone who wants to make their money work for them. Thank you. Thanks, so much, Sarah. Sarah. We are dishing. That that makes it sound mm. juicy too. It makes it sound like we're getting together juicy. and we're, we're dishing on stuff. And we are. Yeah, we <laughs> we definitely are. Good point. So yeah. Anyhow, dishin'. give us a review. Get get us some more friends. Get yourself some more friends by leaving us a review, and we'll see you next week. Bye, guys. Bye. Frugal Friends is produced, edited, and mixed by Eric Siriano. Um, Jen, what is the craziest thing you have done to get rid of your debt? Craziest? Craziest. I'm not a very crazy person. Right. So for you, (laughs) what's the craziest? (laughs) Gosh, I wish I was more fun and crazy. Get out of here. You are fun and crazy. You responded to a random Facebook request invite, and that's how we met. Yeah, I think so. This may not be crazy, but to some it wasn't crazy to me, but to some people it might be crazy. Yeah, but I I worked in foster group homes for years. I remember um, that. Was that part of that? Was that considered like a side hustle for you? Yeah, that that was a side job for me. Like every weekend I was at one of the. One of four smaller group homes and one, like, large 24-kid group Mm -hmm. home. And sometimes I would get punched. Sometimes kids would run away. Uh, Sometimes they would be the most precious uh, (laughs) humans on the planet. You just never knew what you were going to get. And then, yeah, sometimes I would get shingles. So you so. put up with physical <laughs> abuse in order to yeah, it was never painful. Pay off your debt. I actually think the I had to break up a fight once and I I left and I went home and I had like a fist sized bruise on my thigh, mm. but I didn't feel it in the moment. So um because <laughs> your adrenaline was going because you were in the middle of a crisis. Right, right. Yeah. So that was yeah. pretty. I mean, I don't think a lot of people would do that. No, no, that's definitely to pay crazy. Off debt. Mm-hmm. So you did it. You're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing. I don't know if that's like the bar <laughs> we want to set, but yeah. And it's still, ha- I still want to foster and adopt. Mm. So it didn't change my view on that. Fantastic. Should I ask you the same question, Jill? Have you done something crazy? <laughs> should we should I ask you this while we're still recording? Yeah. <laughs> um I mean you already know probably the most dramatic is living in a trailer. You know, like that that was the reason. I mean yeah. other reasons too. We like the minimalist lifestyle and all of that, but 
That's why, you know, downsize. Yeah. And you're heading back in there. Heading back Your into 170 trailer. square feet. Yeah. It's adorable. It's yeah. adorable. Yeah. We're going to have to do an episode on that. I'm getting people we asking will. me about it. So we will. It's coming. All right. A group of high school students started a project to research a string of unsolved murders. There is no profile of this killer except for the ones the students created. What if this guy's still alive? Like, what if he comes after us? Once you start getting a few tips or a few leads or a few identifications, then the cold case isn't so cold anymore. This is Murder 101. Listen to Murder 101 on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Discover the heartwarming and hilarious world of sibling connections on Sibling Revelry with Kate Hudson and Oliver Hudson. Dive into family tales, explore the human mind, and laugh with guests like Joel and Benji Madden. It's more than a podcast. It's a celebration of the ties that bind us. And it's fun because we've decided to open it up to really like all kinds of different siblings. And it's going to be an awesome season. Listen to Sibling Revelry with Kate Hudson and Oliver Hudson on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.